I'm Wendy Hartsock, science and peptide enthusiast. In this two-part episode of Exploration Science, I met up with Jan Paulus, a scientist at Polypeptide Group, and Jonathan Collins, the Vice President of Business Development for CEM. We discussed some of the opportunities and the challenges of greening peptide science. So, 2008, were we thinking about green chemistry back then, Jan? <laughs> Was that a thing? It wasn't as uh, pronounced, it wasn't as, in, uh, I would say yes, but I would say what has evolved since was more the um, the semantics, you know, the um, it was, uh, what you see over the last uh, decade or so, or I mean, let's say even past five years, it's becoming more, you know, accelerated year by year is uh, the, you know, the emphasis on um, calling the, the, um, the terminology, if you will, but I was saying that um, the greening of, uh, of, of uh, peptide chemistry and chemistry per se, it's just, you know, what the, what the uh, people have been saying in the industry for decades is that it's been, uh, the movement has been going on uh, for, for decades. It's just people have not been uh, labeling it as such. It's been just a common sense that you're obviously trying to, you know, minimize the waste. And uh, we, we, we've seen that... Um, some chemicals have become uh, uh, restricted or even banned uh, prior to uh, you know the um, prior to Anastas really formulating the, the 12, twelve principles uh, uh, two decades ago and uh, so on and so forth. Yeah, ten, ten years ago, I would say the, uh, the the notion of green chemistry in peptide science was I would call uh, talk about uh, the the era of infancy in two thousand twenty one. Almost in the books, I would say it's. Um, you know, I would say everyone is definitely fully aware. I would, I would, my hope would be that if we talk uh, again and uh, just to have a reasonable time horizon in five years' time, we'll be, uh, we'll be talking about a phase where, um, where green chemistry uh, thinking and implementation is more or less standard. We still um, need to do much more in terms of the, you know, the adoption if and when the uh, peptide. Uh, synthesis community as a whole is um, supposed to be delabeled. Like, you know, you have this uh, perception that, you know, it's uh, compared to the small molecules um, manufacturing, that it's such a generally a wasteful thing to do to, to, uh, to manufacture uh, peptides in, uh, in any way or in any, in any scale, you know, that's, um, that's been the, the perception for, for such a long time. But uh, I would say at times there are changing. Yeah. That's great. What um, in the manufacturing uh, arena? Where, like, what parts of the process um, are easiest to sort of green, um, and what are the hardest parts? So the easiest part to green is, of course, um, to, do, to, to do something in the lab is um, is always the first thing you're going to do, right? If you if you're going to you get an idea one night and you want to try it the next morning, you probably won't, you're not going to do it in a hundred liters reactor. So you're going to do it in the, in the, in the lab just to um, prove the point or prove that the, the, um, the, what the, you know, you can, uh, your concept is, um, can actually be sustained. You know, you make your first peptide and then you of course do some uh, scope studies around that, but that's uh it's uh, it's this uh, famous uh, Elon Musk uh, 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 quote, and if you're aware of this, I keep uh, reminding myself on that whenever I'm trying to come up. It's a new um, green peptide synthesis uh, uh, methodology where, where he says the prototypes are, are easy. Upscaling is uh, is difficult. Uh, is staying. Um, uh, cash flow positive is um, excruciating. In other words, you know you can uh, you can do a lot of things in the lab when you when you decouple the concerns about you know um, staying in the in the green on the on the on the bottom line. And then of course, if somebody will you know give you a budget of sorts, then you can scale things up. But to to make things uh, you know economically sustainable and being be, being used without 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 them being on the life support that's really the um that's really the tricky part i think you often oftentimes you see the new uh, new methodologies and uh beautiful pieces of science that are 
that end up being not as um, consequential, if you will, if the um, part of the the thinking behind the inventions were like, you know, go through nuts and bolts of how do you actually make sure of that once the you know the you have your um, planted the flag and you uh, publish the paper or uh, file the patent that what are the, the necessary next steps that will that will make sure that the things get uh, that will things will actually get uh, adopted because in my opinion you know new advances in the methodology whether the tip or not are great but ultimately um, if things don't get adapted then you know that's it's it's not necessarily all for naught because you know it's still somebody might get inspired by what you've done and take the, the step further in the different direction but Ultimately, the part of the uh, the thinking should be uh, that you know what, what do you need uh, need to make uh, make sure of uh, that uh, how do I actually make this uh, uh, economically um, viable for the user? Yeah, John can sure. speak to this directly, right? Because here you have. I mean, so maybe you can also talk, John, about when you started thinking about you know greening. And that, by the way, that's a new term to me, like that I learned from you, Jan, um, earlier when we spoke, uh, I guess it was last year at this point. Um, and I like that term, the greening of, of peptide uh, science and science in general. Um, but John, you know, I guess for you, like when did you start thinking about having that impact on green chemistry? And then to all of Jan's points, because you're in a unique position being an inventor at an instrument company where you can just add in technology that is green and kind of show users like, oh, here, you're already doing green chemistry. So, so maybe you can talk a little bit about that. Oh, yeah, certainly. I think yeah. it's, it's interesting, like, uh, you know, like the whole field, it seems like started out and evolved with just enabling the ability to make peptides. You know, you've got to sort of show, it was just a great, there's a lot of pioneers in this whole field, you know, obviously with um, going way back, showing, hey, we can make peptides and really developing the chemistry so it's like, we can work with these peptides, we can generate them. And a lot of great uh, chemistry development in terms of, you know, activators, resin, solvents, everything. And I think that, you know, it almost has to be your primary focus in the beginning saying it's a technology that can allow you to produce peptides. So you kind of start there and then over time you realize, okay, we've accomplished the goal, we're producing peptides and people can do research on them. But then you kind of look back and say, well, okay, we want to improve this process. We're using a lot of reagents we got here. And that it was a necessary thing to do in the beginning to, to sort of prove it as a viable technology. Um, I, I think there was also a lot of groups in the beginning that were doing a lot of methodology development. I felt like it slowed um, after a while on that because maybe funding for groups, you know, getting funding to do methodology development got sort of less attractive for grants, things like that. And, uh, it was more on the biology side and the use of the peptides. So I felt like the technology kind of plateaued for a while. Um, when we got in, the original interest with the microwave was, you know, we really looked at it and looked at speed and purity for peptides. And it was exciting to say, hey, we can take a process um, that takes a long time and we can really speed that up. I don't know that we really recognized the whole holistic view of everything and you know, really greening of all parts of it. It was more taking what had been done and, you know, step one was just to prove it could work and not uh, make things faster, but not cause a lot of negative side effects. And so it kind of, our thinking evolved as we got into it. And you obviously get a lot of feedback you learn from people you talk to that are using it and your, your view of everything sort of starts to, to broaden. Um, and I think, I think that's sort of where we got to and exactly like Jan was saying, you know, it's a really broad term, green chemistry. It can mean and encompass a lot of different things. So, and in a lot of times, I think you have to be careful because you could look at it, say, if, if you're saying, I want a green peptide synthesis and I'm going to replace reagent A with reagent B that's something greener, you know, you might go down a path, do work on that and show that it, you could potentially do that. But if you don't look at the whole process and what that causes other things in terms of maybe subtle impurities or downstream processing or, you know, how much energy you're having to put into the system to use that maybe excess of reagents and also how robust it is. That's the other real trick with peptides. Every sequence can be different. So if you, 
if you showcase something with a certain sequence, but then you go to other sequences and it just doesn't hold up or you're having to really like fine tune and optimize for every sequence, it, it becomes a pretty big burden. And you can see people, especially on the R and D scale, you kind of lose interest because you're like, this is a nightmare. I'm just trying to make a lot of peptides to do research. I don't want the synthesis to become its own research project for every sequence I'm making. I think you, you know, if you're manufacturing a larger amount of something, you know, you're probably willing to put more investment in into having an individual process for that sequence. So sometimes the considerations there are, are, um, are different. We've kind of seen too, like there's a couple paths you can take and I almost think there might be a shorter term path for so longer term path. Um, you know, the first process I, uh, we've kind of looked at a lot, and I know Jan's done a lot of great work in this too, is, is really taking what's out there and minimizing the reagents you use, make it more efficient and, and start there. Cause you know, you can have the bigger vision of say doing peptides in water or um, changing the whole fundamental process. And I think that's, those are great things and we should be doing a lot of exploratory work in there, but probably not losing the mindset too, that we're still, a lot of these processes are just constantly ongoing right now. And we should also try to make things as efficient as we can with the current reagents. There's a lot of economies of scale too, of things like FMOC amino acids in place that, you know, if it's a more revolutionary process where we're going to some totally different process, that's going to take time to get those manufactured in large amounts and used. So I think step A and where we've really tried to, look at it with, you know, the microwave, we've seen we can really reduce the amount of deep protection reagent we use, which then makes the amount of washing you need much easier, higher temperature for washing. And you can kind of start there, lower reagents, get the whole process as efficient as possible. And I think a lot of that work has been, you're seeing it both at the R and D and production scale now, and that, that's been great for the, for the industry. There is some kind of um, challenges that are out there, like the regulatory side of like impurities and things like that. That's also getting more stringent. And, you know, the peptides that people are looking at a lot of times are getting longer and more complex. So you have these competing effects where you want to sort of achieve these end goals of like more pure, more complex synthesis, but we're also trying to make the process greener and it, it puts some strain on things sometimes because it almost, that causes an effect to push you back to well, what just fundamentally works best and it might not be the most green process. But I think there's segments we can carve out of this and say, like one is cosmetic peptides, if they're shorter, easier peptides and maybe some of the regulatory is stringent, those might be low hanging fruit where we can bring in some of the green chemistry now. Um, but it's, uh, but it's interesting. I, I think that holistic view is really kind of necessary to see what, you know, what the whole uh, effect is of making something green and what the goals are. Yeah, and I saw a lot of nodding. So I know that you agree with a lot of what John was saying. Yeah, me and John, we've had some uh, good talks about this uh, topic over the years. Mm -hmm. So this is uh, I'm, I'm not kind of uh, feeling appreciated there. John is come, uh, coming from and also he's one of the guys in the, this arena who is not just, uh, you know, doing the talk. He's a kind of, uh, it's, it's always interesting to, to, to talk to someone who actually um, is uh, one of the, um, uh, the drivers, the contributors of the, of, the, of, of the field because at the end of the day, that's uh, how you do change by actually, uh, you know, putting whatever visions and the, uh, and ideas uh, you have to um, to practice. And I really like John's uh, view on things that you have, at the end of the day, you have to be prag pragmatic as it pertains to what has, uh, what actually does have a ch chance of being uh, implemented because uh, like uh, uh, John was saying, you know, if, if you stray away a bit too much from the, uh, the, uh, the, the mainstream way of doing things, you really, Unless you really, really, really think it through, like, you know, if you make like an entire whole new set of uh, amino acid derivatives, anybody can do it in the lab. Uh, and, you know, this, uh, you can say that FMOC uh, amino acids specifically are not uh, particularly green, uh, not least due to the fact that the FMOC group uh, comes from uh, fluorine 
and fluorine is fossil fuel based. So, you know, you can always find the, the, uh, the moniker non-green for, for what you do. So in that sense, you can say, okay, you have to abandon the FMOC uh, amino acid altogether to be able to have that green moniker. But in doing so, you know, you end up in an avenue where things are just too exotic, or too expensive. They just going to, unless you really have a backer like um, Jeff Bezos or whoever is going to uh, throw a few, a few billion dollars that, you know, uh, make a new, um, new class of uh, amino acid derivatives, you know, up and running with the, with the, with the necessary um, uh, re regulate, uh, regulating aspects to it. It will just not, it will not come to life in its own right. I mean, I remember this uh, a few years ago, there was a conference, uh, the, um, John was there with, um, in Monterey, where it was this, this uh, talk about a uh, tribute to um, Louis Carpino. And, you know, Carpino himself was a um, proponent of Bismarck and always felt Bismarck is chemically superior to F FMOC and a bunch of uh, and numerous other groups have been proposed and uh, showcased in the lab studies to work uh, much better than the FMOC, but it's just at the end of the day, the, the, these innovations uh, are not uh, really caught up because they were just not uh, more fit to the purpose of what what the what the, the what practitioners in um, in all uh, all walks of life. You just need something robust. You need something uh, available and uh, you know uh, on all kind of scale, and it, it can be easily uh, expanded to new um, non natural amino acid derivatives. You just so as, as so I think the the uh, line of thinking where you just stick with the FMOC amino acid based universe and you know really really um, instead of the revolution trying trying to revolutionize the whole thing like to, to abandon them just but and you try to do this sort of super evolution approach where you just don't evolve in on a small increment, but just evolve within the FMOC amino acid based world, but in a way that that really takes some of, you know, because if you, if you, if you look at the argumentation against, let's say, um, making, um, making uh, a peptide about FMOC SPPS, which is the standard methodology, it's always the same, like it's too wasteful, you know, uh, large amounts of solvents, uh, hazardous solvents like, uh, um, uh, like the DMF large excesses of uh, balance, whether that's, you know, the uh, there's a, a bunch of uh, alternative platforms uh, which are, you know, just using that, that sort of argumentation, but it's actually um, not very, um, not a very useful way of uh, argumenting because that's, you actually argumenting against, uh, let's say, uh, an FMOC as PPS methodologically how it looked a few decades ago, right? This is not, a, you know, if you just, let's just give you an analogy about like um, a car business. If you, if you know, if you make an electric uh, car, you know, you have, you know, you want to outperform the conventional car. You have to, you cannot really compare yourself from the, uh, with the, uh, with the cars, how they were in 1930s, because you had, you know, conventional cars there. And of course, and then any electric car would be, would be better than that. So it's a, uh, I think it's as, as, as the FMOCUS PPS based methodology is just, um, pushing the, um, the boundaries and uh, bars higher and higher. It's, um, you know, there is this uh, school of thought that it's, um, that, that it will be the prevalent uh, methodology for decades to come, you know, for the, let's just call it the foresee foreseeable future for, for, for the lack of better, better words. And I agree with John that that should not stop people from trying to come up with uh, things that are really trying to, you know, do away with that uh, that way of making peptides, but I just uh, believe that if, if those uh, those initiatives should ultimately succeed, there has to be better uh, thinking in, ter in terms of what will it be, what will it entail to get to the state of maturity which the the FMO command has. And yeah, the FMO group in its own right is not a Green, it's fossil based, and uh, you know the the the, the, tr mm -hmm. the 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 true purist of the green chemistry will will always uh, point that out. But you know that's that's fine and fair enough. But if you want to, you know, eliminate that, then it's it's not enough just to sh show in the lab that you have this group that it's based on um, barbituric acid. Just to give you an example, it just has come up for the, the literature for uh, recently on the. 
and that's you know or the most water soluble groups we've seen a number of those come and go it's uh, again back to elon musk you know uh, prototypes uh, in that regard are easy you, know, you uh, we will see more of those but i would just wish that somebody would be more willing to realistically acknowledge that this where the world is we need i mean there is this um recent review in the, this journal called i science by um by david um, Con uh, constable from um from G green chemistry institute and he's really proponent of the it just came out, uh, came out a few days ago. It's uh, it's actually an open uh, journal, so you can uh, you can check it out. Uh, uh, it's uh, freely available, and he goes. Uh, he's a proponent of the, the the. There has to be bigger viewpoint, like a hel helicopter viewpoint, on the uh, the, the where green and sustainable chemistry is just a part of a sort of a system thinking, where you really in, incorporate thinking about the you know. Uh, life cycle assessment and the uh, is, uh and the green chemistry uh, is just a small portion that, of, of that and he has just um i need to quote this uh this uh this, this one uh, one line from his uh, this this review where he just says that for many academic research chemists and the institution that fund them the real chemistry is decoupled from any notion of application or development it is science to advance the science of chemistry not to fulfill the needs of um, human society. And I think if you think beyond the peptide chemistry that we are, uh, I, I wouldn't think it's an exaggeration to, to call, call the state of affairs now planet a burning platform of, uh, of, of sorts with, these, uh, the, with the, um, the, the climate crisis and the, the, the wastefulness of, our, uh, of, of the mankind and so on and so forth. So I think we need to start to I think in some some way it's okay and expected that the then the academia you will see um, some or fair amount of science for the for the, for the sake of advancement of the science, but taking into account the as a society we start being more demanding on on the um, of the um, of the uh, scientists working. Uh, you know, irrespective of whether it's academia or industry, sh should be more critical and uh, demanding to that the uh, that the works are better justified as it pertains to the yeah. um, how do they how they put into the use. That's just. I a, do think that's a that's such a great point. I you know I've, I've brought that up before with other folks that it's it's probably a movement that's going to take just you know americans and europeans and africans and not just the not just the chemists not just polypeptide not just the em not just companies it's going to take people who these companies are making medicines for to say we want the medicine and we also want our planet to be taken care of and the government agencies that regulate those medicines need to push that right that they also they need, need to, to demand that there should be like a it shouldn't yeah. be enough that you make a life saving life saving medicine. It should be uh, mm -hmm. making life saving medicine slash uh, not uh, not uh, causing a burden on the planet. At the same time, that's really the, that's really the, 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 the and doing it uh, in a way that you don't have to break the bank uh, to right. do so. That's really like the the the, the, the triple bottom line. It is uh, yeah. of course advancing the science. The um, the uh, kind of environmental and the economical sustainability. I think these, uh, ultimately these things uh, do have to go uh, hand in hand. Otherwise, it's just not uh, never really, um, never really fly. Because I just, I'm just not um, as far as the greening or the more the movement in the more sustainable direction, whether it's peptide or in general. Mm -hmm. I'm just uh, totally against that the technology, new te greener technologies. Uh, mean um, that mm -hmm. they are significantly more co costly. That that just means that if, you, if things are perceived as greener, are more costly. That that just means that you have to really thought hard, hard enough how to do how to do that. Because that to me that automatically excludes um, some the poorest part of the the global population, whether it's you know the the, the lower income classes in the developed world, or you know the uh, the third world countries all together. They just uh, cannot uh, afford to 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 go greener right. if it means more expensive that's just um 
It's yeah. just uh, goes without saying. So, so uh, supposing, I mean, I guess kind of to back up or to bring it more to, to now, because I agree with you, I think like long term, we all have to come together and, and just and question each other at conferences and publications. Could you have done this differently, especially at the, the discovery level? But thinking about the fact that we are using f mock amino acids and in the foreseeable future, we will be continuing to use f mock amino acids. What are the best technologies right now to help improve the greening of both R&D for John and um, manufacturing for, for Jan? So. Best technologies. Well, I guess I could step back and say maybe two things I see we can do in this room. One is it's exactly like the work Jan is doing is take the the current realities of, of where we are. And like, for instance, the, the recent work uh, he did with HCN formation, you know, with Oxum. Oxum is in use. It's, it's replaced a lot of the benzotriazoles and their explosive properties. Um, you know, this issue of it forming HCN by reacting with, um, DIC, you know, became an issue and potentially a concern as you get to larger scales and larger manufacturing. So there's a reality that we don't necessarily have the best replacement for Oxmo. You know, that's a goal to kind of work out and improve it, but also coming up with techniques. How can we minimize HC formation with still using Oxmo? And I think, so that was some great work that's kind of the way we should be thinking too, like, hey, here's some solutions to make things work or make the process better. We'll still look longer term at R&D and replacements for these chemicals. Same things with the green solvents, you know, looking at individually at, um, you know, mixing two solvents together, treating the deep protection and the coupling reaction separately. I think those were some great insights um, that Jan and his group sort of brought to the forefront. So it's really recognizing the reality is not just trying to apply a one size fits all with a, a green solvent to everything, but where it can um, best be utilized. I think fundamentally with the current constraints of the FMOC SPPS process, the best thing we could do is look at increasing the kinetics of the reactions, that that's where the benefits are going to get. Because when you do that and basically making it more like a solution phase process in terms of having the reaction go quicker, that just makes everything better in terms of the more force you've got to push on the reactions, the, um, you know, in terms of equivalence or energy, the side reactions with the polymerization. And I think it's also, it could be basically with uh, developments on the resin or some attachment, you know, on the uh, peptide itself, where that's like one product you can innovate and develop on and not sort of try to reinvent a whole economy of, a scale with f mock amino acids. So I do kind of think in this current realm of adding one amino acid at a time, like a process like that, that's I think where there could be development over the next few years before we maybe get to some totally fundamental process, maybe using ribosomes or something totally different. So that's sort of just my feelings on it. Great. Jan, how about you? Yeah, I fundamentally agree with John as, uh, you know, we have to continue to refine the, um, what it really is the, the backbone of how peptides are be, being made, which is the, the ECMO SPPS methodology. That's just not, um, not really being uh, challenged, by, uh, I would say, um, credibly enough by any uh, aspiring techno technology. There is a lot of uh, initiative and, you know, emerging platforms, but the reality of today is that just the, the, um, the overwhelming dominance of the uh, the FMOC SPPS is uh, is um, undisputable in any 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 scale and in any lab through, uh, throughout the world. So having acknowledged that is um, yeah, like uh, John was saying with the um, with the issue with the hazardousness of uh, some of the the uh, the starting materials that we use. Uh, you yeah, know, like uh, we've seen with originally with the um, uh, hydroxybenzotriazoles, um, these have been, you know, the most uh, widely used uh, coupling additives for, for decades. And then, of course, uh, the ex uh, explosive and the hazardous has really um, changed that perception. Then the uh, DIC Oxima has, uh, has really been, um, been ramping up and has been, um, become widely pop uh, popularized, uh, obviously, thanks to uh, our bridge uh, groups, who has been uh, the, uh, the biggest proponent of that. And 
And then what we've seen, like uh, John was alluding to, that uh, everything is subject to change. That once you th you think that you know this is everything is uh, working out, then uh, and you, uh, a reagent is perceived as a, as a as green until a new a new discovery shows that there are some aspect that kind of that um, that render it um, EHS problematic for one way or the other, and of course with the HCN formation, which was originally uh, discovered by the Li Lilly, that uh, they just uh, mix the uh, the two reagents with ethanol amino acid and observe the HCN. Right. You know, it is difficult to not to take that uh, into account. Uh, ultimately, you will have to address it one way one way or the other. So, what we've seen uh, since since then, there has been no. <laughs> by ourselves, but also by uh, Albrecht, who obviously is uh, by, uh, heavily invested in making sure that these uh, these reagents are uh, continuously uh, developed and defined and new uh, carbodiamides or you know, like John was alluding to a way of just the su subtle changes to your to your to your coupling pro protocols. You don't have to really throw all your all your uh, favorite uh, toys away you just have to find a way new way of playing with them to make them safer that's uh, that, that that's okay too but I, I i actually think it it shouldn't be either or in that regard it should be all of the all of the above uh, pertains to what there is. it's always better to have uh, you know more than one tool in your in your shed right it's just that gives you the uh, you know the the option to really Choose choose the one which is fit for the particular pr pr purpose. Uh, but I, I, if I should um, add one thing from the manufacturing perspective, what we see emerging is the um, combination of the so very mature FMOCUS PPS strategies, which are going to be uh, um, fine tuned to uh, the, with respect to solvent consumption and the uh, amounts of uh, of. Uh, of uh, the amino acid and the reagent and so forth, and you see in particular for the um, for the longer pep uh, uh, peptide targets um, emergence of the thought process that even on the um, on the um, industrial scale you should be uh, taking into account um, fragment strategies, and that's really um, you know for for a decade or so you could see that even like relatively long peptides, uh, let's say thirty mer or forty mer. Uh, 40 plus merits or reasonably wrong peptide manufacturing scale you should still uh, still uh, try to tackle it uh, by uh, straight through um, SPPS even on a multi-kilogram scale nowadays you see uh, there the trend is that um, there are proponents of a variety of uh, hybrid strategies whether it's you know you should use uh, you should use protected um, peptide fragments in capillary solution or uh, unprotected. These, uh, these, uh, there's different schools on thought on that, and it often, oftentimes it um, it varies by, um, I would say, um, company philosophy because you know there is the there is not like a universal consensus like you know one company you would you would say let's say a similar GLP analog you would see. Uh, you know, some uh, pharmaceutical company would make it on a large scale just by straight through SPPS, and uh, some other would just uh, say that, uh, you know, in 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 our uh, in our setting, in in our economic reality, uh, making uh, three uh, frag uh, fully protected fragments and coupling them in solution works out better. And that's uh, you know, it's as they say, there's more than one way to skin a cat. I, I would just say, what well, uh, you know, you have to acknowledge that it's probably actually beneficial. That there are these uh, these um, these um, sim uh, these te technologies kind of uh, coexist um, uh, si uh, side by side, and I think uh, what you will see and in, um, in uh, going forward will definitely be uh, yeah more of um, the um, manufacturing by uh, let's say um, peptide fragments that are made by FMOG SPPS uh, because that enables. Uh, in the uh, incorporation of uh, an, an unnatural amino acids or even non uh, amino acid based building blocks and you know co com, uh, uncoupling them in uh, unprotected in um, in solution phase i think we will see the further um, fine tuning and industrialization of the uh, you know chemical or enzymatic uh, ligation methodology that the these will be more um, mm -hmm. accepted and adopted um, in um, in uh, in uh, manufacturing because right now by and large you would say that the uh, the ligation methods are more 
the R and D domain, but the uh, thing that the you will you will see that these things can be also adopted and implemented into to manufacturing as well in combination with the um, with highly uh, highly uh, highly efficient uh, mm -hmm. uh, FMOG SPPS method. And in that regard, I I have to fully agree and give a nod to John that uh, you know uh, temperature is um, sometimes um, under underutilized um, parameter in uh, peptide manufacturing of course in lab scale everybody is uh, aware of you know the the, the huge uh, beneficial impact uh, uh, the, um, the increasing temperature not only by microwaves can um, can have on the um, on the kinetics and uh, you know how fast you can uh, you can make peptides and how in the great purities and so on and so forth I would still think that in the industrial setting you still see a, a school of thought that say that's uh, you know temperature control less uh, SPPS, that's great for the but uh, for the scale up that's probably not going to be as uh, as successful and i think it will change because uh, if you, you know for me the, you know, the large scale peptide manufacturing without temperature control you just uh, that's just being too reductionistic you're leaving something on the table as far as how can you um, improve the um, the um, the uh, the efficiency to the similar extent as you do uh, as you do in the um, in, in in the lab scale? In that regard, yeah, cut out to to John. I've seen uh, some of the, um, the beautiful papers done by Papini's group that you know really um, you know try, trying to demonstrate that the uh, the um, the, um, the technologies used for for for, uh, for accelerating peptide chemistry, chemistry in the lab scale, ultimately, ultimately they uh, the um, they have to be proven or disproven and uh, you know, by the scale up. So it's always good to see that uh, when uh, when you, when you see the uh, the reports and when actually um, the, these things are proven to work uh, quite quite nicely in the um, multigram or even hundreds of gram scale. That's just you know I think that will eventually uh, change that conviction that the uh, that room room temperature spps uh, at the at manufacturing scale is still the golden standard i would say that um, room temperature spps uh, in any scale is uh, just um, is uh, is a status uh, status quo sort of uh, project you know if you really want to achieve a greater Efficiency, which means uh, uh, greater greenness, you have to um, you have to control the temperature. Whether that means uh, heating or cooling, that is really subjective. Because if we were on the Mars, we would probably have to, uh, you know, uh, we would have to co uh, uh, cool the reactors to to go because the the, the temperature was uh, is, uh, so much higher. So you know, in that sense, room temperature is re relatively um, arbitrary term. But you should. Uh, you should definitely take advantage of what John was saying. It pertains to much improved kinetic uh, kinetics in uh, SPPS, where uh, which you can attain by temperature control, and it just makes some of the um, phenomena that you observe at uh, at room temperature becomes um, becomes redundant because if you take into account the beneficial effect of the of the uh, of the acceleration of the kinetics by uh, by heating, then well, you it opens up the a whole new world for you. So that's um yeah. I was I think we will definitely see more of that um uh, going forward in the in this industrial setting. It will be more more widespread. Thank you for tuning into part one. Make sure you come back next week for part two. As always, we appreciate your feedback as well as your suggestions for topics that you'd like to see covered. Thanks again for tuning in.